general theory of relativity is a theory of gravity, which was developed by Albert Einstein between 1907 and 1915. The overall theory states that the observed gravitational attraction between masses results from the warping of space-time. In this video, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to give you a complete roadmap, a complete journey into this fascinating theory, Einstein's general theory of relativity. Overloaded with equations, indices, tensors, mathematics, differential geometry, most of the physics enthusiasts, especially the students who are starting their journey into relativity, gets confused. Where do I start? Where to go? What are the books that I should read? What are the important components that I should learn? And what are the basics of relativity that should start building upon one after the other? Don't worry, in this video, I'm going to dive deep into those concepts. I'm going to give you a complete roadmap, a complete understanding into this theory. After that, if you want for advanced studies, you can look into the specific chapters, take into books, do the mathematics. But I can tell you, this video is going to give you a thorough idea and most importantly, the important concepts that rotates around relativity. So I would request you have a pen and a paper, relax, sit down, because I'm going to take you through a wonderful, fascinating journey the best theory which has shaped our understanding in understanding the nature, space, and time. My name is Seanak and you're watching me on my channel, Physics for Students. Okay, so first of all, write on your screen, what are the topics that we are covering? Yes, we are covering a lot of topics. We will start with general relativity, which is a theory of geometry. Then we are going to understand the basics of special to general theory, the advent of non-Euclidean geometry because uh, uh, the non-Euclidean and Riemannian geometry dominates this is the basic foundation of relativity, development of tensor calculus, postulates of general relativity, who was Marcel Grossman, why do we need tensors most important in relativity, the Einstein-Hilbert debate, the field equations which dominates the relativity theory, what are geodesics, does gravity affect the path of a light, the famous Einstein uh, Eddington's experiment of the solar eclipse. What do we mean by exact solutions of general relativity, the Schwarzschild radius, and lastly, does time stop near black, black hole? Now, before I go ahead, I would like to inform the viewers or those who are already aware and you are wonderful subscribers to my channel. Most importantly, the details, the mathematical details of each of those components are being dealt separately in some of my videos. If you go to my playlist in general relativity, you will find Riemann curvature tensor, does gravity affect light, metric tensor, all of them are being dealt separately. Because the objective of this video is to take you through this wonderful, fascinating journey, a little bit into mathematics, but mostly what are the building blocks and how you should study so that you don't miss on to the important parts of relativity. So if you're really interested to go ahead, further details, welcome. You go to my playlist, select those videos, and you can go ahead. But however, this is more or less of a complete overview, complete journey on general relativity. The name general theory of relativity, uh, generally when I, uh, when I look into this, uh, it sometimes fascinates me. If you look into the way general theory has been developed, especially starting from special relativity, then it has moved into general relativity, you will see that the term relativity is less in general theory, but more into special theory. Special theory is a, um, is a theory which deals with relativity, simultaneity, causal structure of space-time, speed, velocity, time dilation, length contraction, right? So what I'm trying to tell is that general relativity is more of a theory of geometry. It is more about curvature of space-time. It is how the entire shape, uh, I would say the geometrical shape of space and time has changed. Uh, uh, it is not a point of argument whether the term relativity has been derived from special theory and it has put into uh, general theory. That is up to the historians. But what I would like to make a note is that in general theory, if you are coming with the term relativity, it, you won't find much of relativistic effects into general theory. What you would find is more into geometry, the curvature of space-time, how things are curved, and what are the new ways of measurement which has developed we will soon see. 
So special theory of relativity concerns more on the relativistic part, simultaneity, observers, uh, observation on space-time, event happening this, event happening there. But here what we do is that it is mostly of the, uh, the geometry of space-time, the, the, the topology, the structure of space-time and how it changes and what are the measures and what are the problems that we found, find and what are the ways that we can develop. Do you really find difficult to do mathematics or concentrate on the problems of mathematics in a very crowded place, in a very cloistered place where there are a lot of people shouting and talking around? No. For Albert Einstein, it was totally different. As you can see that I started this part of the video by stating uh, what Albert Einstein told, that worldly cloister where I hatched my most beautiful ideas. Yes, we are talking of the Swiss patent office in Bern, uh, where Albert Einstein was uh, uh, working. And it is in this time that he hatched one of the most beautiful ideas uh, right on your screen. I would like to present before you the basics of uh, that idea, what is called the special theory of relativity. Okay, uh, so right on your screen, you can see the date was Friday the 30th. Uh, hopefully not Friday, the 13th, June 1905. So the Annus Mirabilis paper, which comes from the Latin word uh, Mirabilis, which means miracle year, are the four papers that Albert Einstein published in Allen and Der Physik, a scientific journal in 1905. These four papers were major contributions to the foundations of modern physics. They revolutionized science understanding of the fundamental concepts of space, time, energy, and mass. The first paper, as you can see right on the screen, uh, explained the photoelectric effect, which was the only specific discovery mentioned in the citation awarding Einstein the Nobel Prize in Physics. The second paper explained Brownian motion, which led reluctant physicists to accept the existence of atoms. The third paper introduced Einstein's theory of special relativity, and the fourth paper, a consequence of special relativity, developed the principle of mass energy equivalence expressed in the famous equation E equals to mc squared. These two uh, four papers together with quantum mechanics and Einstein's later general theory of relativity are the foundation of modern physics. Now, what I can tell you is that after passing from the basic graduation course, uh, Albert Einstein was unable to find a teaching position. And, and, and it was, uh, I, I think that it was maybe his father, uh, somebody else's uh, reference, that he got into the Swiss patent office in Bern. It was cloistered, it can contain a lot of people coming around, and here he started working. And in this cloistered place, where we find it difficult to work with mathematics and science, he hatched one of the most beautiful ideas. The second illustration right on your screen uh, shows the basic postulates of special relativity. So uh, what we find is that the laws of physics are invariant in all frames of reference. That is one of the tenets of uh, 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 special relativity and second as you find on the screen speed of light in vacuum is constant for all observers so i have just given a, a basic demonstration that initial frame of reference shows f equals to m a and rotating frame of reference f prime equals to m a so this was the foundation that special relativity was born in that cloistered office swiss patent office at bern and uh, you see that the basic idea of special relativity is that it was, uh, it was uh, well working in the inertial frame of reference. However, the non-inertial frame of reference was not in, taken into account. So the general theory of relativity, the limitations, I would say, not the limitations, the basic seed of general theory of relativity was planted in special theory, which dealt with non-inertial frame of reference and with the basic idea that uh, the basic uh, pr supposition that the speed of light is constant for all observers and the speed of light is constant in vacuum. Yes, the equivalence principle. Let us quickly see what does it uh, mention. So in the theory of relativity, the equivalence principle is the equivalence of gravitational and inertial mass and Albert Einstein's observation that gravitational force is experienced locally while standing on a massive body is the same as the pseudo force experienced by an observer 
in a non-initial frame of reference. So if you have read Albert Einstein's general thought of developing general relativity is that once he was at the patent office sitting, uh, doing a lot of patents, I remember uh, it was basically refrigerators and different kind of patents he needs to observe and find out whether the patent is right or not. He suddenly, uh, you know, uh, realized that uh, he was sitting on a, like a chair like this and suddenly if the floor collapses and if he falls down from that uh, floor and while he was falling down uh, while sitting on the chair he would feel nothing he would feel weightless so the weightlessness is the basic concept uh, really it's wonderful that suddenly why would he think that the floor collapsed and he uh, moves down so the weightlessness is basically the idea of general relativity and right on your screen uh, the first illustration here it comes that uh, special theory from general theory to special theory it is called a non-inertial frame of reference that means one that is undergoing an acceleration and the fictitious force that is Newton's laws which was working well with gravity except for a moving object moving close to the speed of light that was what special theory of relativity was and from non initial frame of reference now we are moving to a frame of reference where things are accelerating fast here is a quick note which you will see i have highlighted on the illustration right on your screen that we often say what are the limitations of special theory of relativity right oh, oh, is it is it that special theory of relativity is wrong now this is a common misnomer which i have seen seen within students using the term norm uh, wrong limitations no there is no limitation. Special theory of relativity is absolutely perfect and it works well within the inertial frame of reference. Whenever we start accelerating to non-inertial frame of reference, we need a new theory where the laws of physics of special relativity won't work. So that is what general theory of relativity is all about. Please mind it, there is nothing called a limitation or what is the problem or special relativity has failed no it has neither failed nor it has got limitations it is absolutely fine in the inertial frame of reference but not okay in the non-inertial frame of reference let me quickly uh, take you into the principle of equivalence right on your screen you will see uh, the, this this you know, demonstration sh shows that if a person is standing on that ground is more or less equivalent to the person accelerating up the elevator, the famous Gedanken, which is called thought experiment, which Einstein did, that if a person is accelerating upwards on an elevator experiment and a person standing right on the ground would feel the same kind of a pressure. So right on your screen, I have just tried to demonstrate gravitation and inertial forces of a similar nature are often indistinguishable. So that is what uh, in outer space somebody f floating and I am falling down is indistinguishable. The gravitational force as experienced locally while standing on a massive body is the same as uh, experienced by an observer in a non-inertial frame of reference. So uh, as uh, the experiment suggests that if you're moving up the elevator, right, if you're moving up the elevator, the light ray is coming like this and as the elevator moves up, the light ray which is supposed to go straight is slowly bending down. It's slowly bending down. This led to the conclusion that why light rays which is supposed to go straight and hit the other end is curving down. It is because that the space time is being curved. So here we lay the seed of general relativity that from inertial frame we are moving to non-inertial frame and we have observed that the light ray on an elevator experiment is bending. What causes the bending? Okay, now let us take a pause into what Einstein thought and what was going on in his mind about physics, etc. And let us quickly take a look back uh, round about uh, 1792 and let us see the physics, rather than physics, the mathematics, how it was evolving. Right on your screen is the photograph of uh, Nikolai Ivanovich Lobach Vesky. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, idea behind showing you is that we are now taking a flash 
flashback, right? We are going into something where physics is not involved, but most importantly, how geometry is evolving because we will connect those dots. Now, Ivanovich Lubachevsky was a Russian mathematician and the founder of non-Euclidean geometry, which he developed independently of Janus Bolai and Carl Friedrich Gauss. Lobachevsky actually grew up in a family of moderate means. Family relations were evidently strained. Uh, 1790, his mother was effectively divorced from her husband, and Lobachevsky's teachers were German professors. In particular, the mathematician Martin Bartels, a friend of Gauss, noted for his encyclopedic knowledge of mathematics. In 1812, Lobachevsky received a master's degree from the university, and in 1814, he received the, de the degree of adjunct of pure mathematics and permission to teach independently. So you see Copernicus of geometry, why is called? Because that led to a complete new world of uh, geometry. Born in a moderate family, mentored by Martin Bertels and G Gauss, and he founded hyperbolic geometry, and this is the first time that he found there is a limitation in Euclid's fifth postulate, which triggered off differential geometry. Now, if you look into the phase that I am speaking about, is that people have started to think or uh, you know look into a differential geometry or non-Euclidean geometry, right? So this actually from Lubachevsky and further, I'm not going, you can find it in my video where I've talked at length about differential geometry. This actually led to the foundation of differential geometry or what is called uh, the non-Euclidean geometry. This actually also led to uh, invention of a famous term which is called manifold. Look into your screen. I have tried to give you a very basic definition of a manifold. So you see all those curvature and structures and you see that from manifold, we go into a differential manifold. We will soon explain to you what is a differential manifold, uh, which leads to locally Euclidean structure and the space-time manifold. So you see a, um, a dot, which I have highlighted in red, when it is further magnified, a small dot, and it becomes a kind of a circle. That means that the mathematicians were trying to find out that anything which is on the a manifold or on a structure which is curved, when it is being magnified, it becomes a kind of a circle which is locally Euclidean. That means the structure of the geometry, which is very complex, which contains curvature, etc. How can we find or design a structure where we can use the same Pythagorean theorem or the same Euclidean postulates and find out the local structure and then we map and we go to a higher structure, which are those curvature of space-time. So that is why I try to show you that so you see that locally Euclidean leads to differential geometry and which leads to space-time manifold, which was perfectly entwined by the craftsmanship of Albert Einstein. This is the phase where we are learning about curvature of space-time, cur not curvature of space-time, curvature, curvature of manifold, curvature of geometrical structures. Now, it was during this time that another great mathematician, Bernhard Riemann, founded the basic structure and he coined the term manifold. Here on your screen, you see this is a famous paper on the hypothesis which lie at the basis of geometry. And this paper was actually the doctoral thesis of Bernhard Riemann. So Riemann was the first to do extensive work of generalizing the idea of surfaces to higher dimension. The main manifold comes from the Ber, uh, uh, Ber Riemann's original term, which I would not dare to pronounce, it is in German, which William Kingdon Clifford translated as, as manifoldness. Uh, in his Gottingen inaugural lecture, Riemann described a set of all possible values of a variable with certain constraints because a variable can have many values. So uh, I remember when I read through the history of this paper, it was far, far above the uh, understanding of that, uh, of the people during that era. And it was Carl Gauss who introduced, and he was fascinated how Riemann introduced the concept of manifold. Anyway, we are not going into the history of that. What I'm trying to tell you is that now we are understanding the structure. So Lobachevsky uh, planted the basic seed of referential geometry, where the Euclid's fist postulate, and then we are learning about Bernhard Riemann, 
who actually uh, founded this very important paper. And even today, in the 21st century, this paper is regarded as one of the most modern theories or modern writing in geometry. Okay, right on your screen, I have tried to analyze a manifold. As you can see that uh, the structure of a sphere where the uh, lines are converging. Now, what are those lines? We will come to that later. So it has got a positive curvature. Then there is a cylinder type structure, which is called zero curvature because the lines are all parallel to each other. And then there is a kind of a hyperboloid, uh, which looks uh, where the lines are uh, basically on a negative structure. So what I'm trying to tell is that uh, these are being later discussed later uh, in my previous videos. So the structure of the diff of the geometry, uh, we are differentiating that structure, and we are calling it differential manifold, so that we can apply the rules of calculus and it becomes easy for all of us to study. Now you can see right on your screen there are certain modern differential geomet geometers I have started to give you. Uh, 1900 started with the work of Henri Poincaré on the foundations of topology. In 1914, topological space by the famous Felix Hosdorff. Ellie Carton uh, helped formulate the foundations of differential geometry of smooth manifolds, and Jean Louis Corzul introduced vector bundles. Uh, I am not going to go because I have a separate video on the developments of history of differential geometry. You can look into that. So we already started looking into the geometry in a different way. The structure of the geometry is changing. The Euclidean postulates are no longer holding. And Bernhard Riemann has already laid the foundations on what is called manifold. We were also going to look into what we call is the development of tensor calculus. Now here, I, rec I, 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 I receive certain uh, messages over WhatsApp, etc. Who developed, who invented tensor calculus? Albert Einstein? Absolutely not. It is Albert Einstein who used that uh, uh, idea of tensor calculus. With his help, we will look into that. It was not Albert Einstein who actually developed tensor calculus. Right on your screen, I have given you a very brief idea about the development of tensor calculus. In 1822, uh, Augustin Cauchy introduced the Cauchy stress tensor in continuum mechanics. The Cauchy stress tensor used for stress analysis of material bodies. Then it was very importantly Sir William Rowan Hamilton, the Irish mathematician and astronomer who coined the word tensor and made important contributions in classical mechanics and abstract algebra. Then you see we have already talked about Bernhard Riemann introducing Riemann curvature tensor. In 1884, Gibbs introduced tensor on the vector of R3 and during that time it was labeled as indeterminate product. Okay, so we next come in 1898 to Dr. Voldemort Foyt, who used tensors to describe stress and strain on crystals. And then Ricci Curbastro, the famous Italian mathematician who developed uh, a Ricci tensor. And then finally, it was Tullio Levi Levi Civita who developed tensor calculus. So this is that to show you that the idea of tensor calculus was developed independently starting from which year? 1822 and we terminated it to 1901. So all these mathematicians on different field of mathematics, continuum mechanics, solid state geometry faced certain problems, faced certain limitations and that is why tensor was being developed. So it was not Einstein, it was developed much earlier and this is how the tensor calculus was developed. With tensor calculus and differential geometry in place, right now it is the time to visit once more to the postulates of general relativity. First on your screen, you can see the first postulate of general relativity, which is called the principle of general covariance. It states that the laws of physics should be independent as observers motion. The equivalence principle, the gravitational acceleration is the same for all observers in gravitation field. Now, you see, whenever we are talking of postulates, the idea of general theory of relativity is being planted in the first principle of covariance. I would like to explain to you what do we mean by pr principles of covariance. Watch on your screen. I have given a kind of a funny demonstration. Co plus vary is covariance. So there are the two terms involved, co and vary, which means to vary together with another variable in a particular way to which may be predictive. 
That means you see if the vector point in your screen goes this way and this way and this way, then it is predicted that it would go that way also. So kind of a mathematical or a physical change which is varying or co-varying with something else. When we use the term co-partner, co-vary, co-league, that means what? That means something with coming with something. So a variation in the mathematical principles is, going, is happening, but with something which gives us a nice and predictable way so that we can understand the laws of nature better, right? The second illustration I, I will just show you. This shows that the person is throwing the ball on the first frame of reference and the second frame of reference it is rota rotated but still the same thing happened the person is throwing the ball in another in below you will see an another frame of reference the event is happening that the ball is throwing the the person is throwing the ball and you see that the frame of reference is being extended so what it happens and then on the right hand side you see that the line which we are measure, measure, uh, measuring on a sphere get extended to an oblate spheroid and the line looks longer so the general so laws, the principle of general covariance of general relativity, which tells that laws of physics themselves should be independent of the observer's motion. That means it should covary. That means we need to find out something which will give us a nice and predictable way that if things are happening out there, and the thing is happening out there, then e even if the things are happening, that means I must find out a way in which I would like to measure them. So the predictable, uh, I would say the predictable nature of measurement is the most important criteria here. So uh, the covariance principle means let things vary, but let us vary in, let it vary in such a way so that we can measure. So the principle of general covariance, the person throwing the ball, two frames of reference, one is rotated, one is being stretched, one, uh, sphere, one sphere, the line is being stretched. So all those changes are happening. But can we find out a measure? Can we find out a tool in which this covariance is measurement? So we have come to that part of history when we are waiting for somebody to come. Guess who is? It is not Albert Einstein. Somebody is coming with a wonderful tool of mathematics. He was just one year senior to Albert Einstein. He was, uh, he met Albert Einstein, they ate together, they met together, they fought together and they become, and they became one of the best friends. And this is what his name is, Marcel Grossman. Right on your screen, I've just uh, showing you uh, brief details of Marcel Grossman. Grossman was born on April 9 in Budapest in Hungary. The son of a large machine shop owner, he was a descendant of an old Swiss family. After graduation, he started at Swiss Polytechnic School in Zurich, referred to as ETH, in the School of Mathematics from 1896 and 1900, together with Albert Einstein and Milev Merrick, the only woman in that class. In the first two years, he learned about calculus, analytic geometry, descriptive geometry, mechanics, projective geometry, and a lot of other things. It was Grossman who helped Einstein with the geometry and the concept of tensor algebra he needed to formalize the theory. He asked Grossman to search the literature and look for existing and appropriate geometry. The next day, Grossman returned with the solution. So uh, as you see that it was Marcel Grossman who introduced the concept of tensor calculus, which was not known to uh, Albert Einstein. If you read the book, Subtle, is the Lord as something, uh, just uh, don't remember the name. You will see that how Albert Einstein was really struggling, 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 unable to find the solution, what is called general covariance principle. Write on your screen quickly. Uh, let us have a look on the development of tensor calculus. This page shows that Grossman introduced Einstein, the Riemann tensor, as a mathematical resource for the general theory of relativity. And this one, this uh, second one, shows Grossman tensor of on the fourth manifold. I've just just tried to elaborate that Grossman tensor and showed it in the entire partial derivatives right below. So these are few of the things which will uh, sh show you, which will give you an idea that how a friend in need comes in. So two friends coming together, one of them aware about tensor calculus, another friend, Albert Einstein, was still find, finding a way to develop his uh, grave theory of relativity, has come, has met, 
and now they are ready to launch one of the greatest theory of relativity with the help of tensor calculus. The next question which comes is that, okay, Marcel Grossman has introduced the concept of uh, tensors to, um, uh, to Einstein, but the question is that why do we need tensors in general relativity? Right on your screen, I have just tried to go show you something. Uh, you can have a close look. You will see that the vector is pointing A, that is the vector, and AX and AY are the components of the vector in the flat surface. Now once we take and move into the curved surface, you see that the AX remains the same, but the uh, vectors, components of the vector, uh, I mean to say in the X direction, which is A prime X extends, and in Y direction, which is A prime Y also extends. So on the box I have shown that A prime X is longer, A prime Y is also longer, and A is invariant. That means when we are moving into the structure of space-time, which is a little bit, I would say, curved, we need to have vectors because vectors are the uh, basic tools in which the laws of mathematics or the, or the measurements would be done. But when we are moving into the curved space-time, although the vectors remains the same, the components of the vectors are changing. Just like the way when the person was throwing the ball, the event remains the same, but the axis has extended or the axis have rotated. The question is then, how do we measure those types of measurement? When the vector would remain the same, but the components of the vector would change. Uh, on your screen right now, you can see that I have demonstrated the same thing, that there is a static frame of reference, AX and AY, these are the two uh, components of the vector, and the rotated frame of reference, A prime X and A prime Y, becomes a little bit longer. So this is the need for tensors. In order to measure the changes in the components of the vector, we have to find out, develop a kind of a mathematical tool so that these tools enhances the change, measure the changes, but the laws of nature, but it would remain invariant. That means if you further go into the details that the angles or measurements, whatever you are doing, that would be invariant. Because if that changes, the laws of physics will fail, right? So here on your screen is a summary that why do we need tensors in general relativity? We need to create a mathematical model so that we can measure or predict the changes further either in the contravariant manner or in the covariant manner. I would like, like to take a pause and just tell you what is contra and co. So when things are changing, that I am moving, the things get extended or something. When it's changing along with that, that means it is covariant. That, that is why the tensor is also used in that way. It is called covariant tensor. But when things are changing and the effect of the change is something uh, contra, that is opposite, that is called a covariant tensor. So you can look. So tensors help in understanding transformational properties, always the same in every coordinate system, and whose components transform in a rise way. So this is tensor, this is the need of tensor. So uh, now I hope you understand from Ivan Lobachkovsky to differential geometry to Riemann curvature tensor and manifold uh, and then to the birth of uh, uh, tensor from William Rowan Hamilton, the need was uh, established much earlier. Marcel Grossman, the person who took or uh, introduced relative uh, tensors to Einstein, this is the need. So right on your screen, the next uh, illustration shows if the vector changes, then there is a problem in measurement. The vector remains invariant. The components of the vector changes. We developed method to measure them. And any mathematical entity which is invariant under rotation of coordinate system is called a tensor. So we have already now established the need for tensor. And if you go back to the principles of general relativity, that the principle of general covariance, that is why uh, sometimes general relativity is called the theory of covariance, the, the covariant theory of gravity, yes. It is called the covariant theory of gravity. That means the change will happen. There is no problem with the change. But how do we measure that change? Uh, the usual way of mathematics won't help. We need to help uh, take a look of tensors because other than that, it won't be possible. We are all set and done. Tensors are in place, non-Euclidean geometry is in place. What else would require? Nothing else. So Albert Einstein, coupled with Grossman and other mathematicians, is about to launch the theory. Everything is ready, and he is about to create history. But there was a problem. 
The problem was that there was another equally talented German mathematician by the name of David Hilbert, and controversy and uh, debate shows that maybe Hilbert was able to submit the paper prior to Einstein. So right on your screen is the photograph of Einstein and Hilbert. So what we can tell from here is that uh, the published version of talk by mathematician David Hilbert was dated on the 20th of November 1915 and is entitled Die Grundlagen der Physik on the foundations Looking of at the controversy, whoever has done it, because in the course of time, in the course of the history of general relativity, it sometimes comes that was it Einstein or was it Hilbert? Right on the screen, you can see on the left-hand side, this is a photograph of the field equations of gravitation by Einstein in 1915. And on the right-hand side, Hilbert's uh, on the foundations of physics, which is in 1916. Now, uh, if you go through the research and the further developments about this controversy, you will come that there has been various kinds of thought. But here I would like to tell you that it was during this time that I, I, I found out a very important paper by uh, Leo Corey. So here is Leo Corey. The perhaps most substantial evidence for the case of priority of Einstein are copies of Hilbert's proof and the original manuscript of his November 20th communication as discovered by Leo Corey in Hilbert's archives. The material became known with the publication of an article in Science magazine entitled Belated Decision on the Hilbert Einstein Priority Dispute. Uh, I, can pro I have provided you that link in the description box. If you really want to read the paper of Leo Corey, it's fascinating, you can go ahead and read that. Now he finds that proof uh, proof of that Hilbert submitted his paper after Einstein did because he was unable to find and was a, for a problem in the laws of covariant nature. We are not worried about either Hilbert or Einstein. Whoever published, it has published. And we, as the physicists and the learners, have got a wonderful theory of relativity. As a due course of time, Hilbert is also remembered. Einstein is also remembered. Two of them are one of the mon have done monumental work in physics and mathematics. It's not a question who have priori prioritized, but world has got the general theory of relativity, and we are trying to understand that. The entire idea of general relativity revolves around this, Einstein's field equations. We are not going to dissect that equation too much because I have done it in several of my videos. But just to give you an overall idea, right on your screen you can see what it is. So the Ricci curvature tensor, which measures how the volume of matter changes when uh, it moves from flat to curved space. Metric tensors, it measures all the causal structure of space-time. Riemann curvature tensor uh, describes the curvature of Riemannian manifolds and stress energy momentum tensor measures the movement of matter through space time. So the left hand side of the equation of Einstein's field equation measures the curvature, how things are being curved and the right hand side measures the matter movement through space and time. That means how matter moves through space and time. So in order to dissect a little bit, here right on your screen uh, are the Einstein's field equations. The first R determines the Ricci curvature tensor, then the Ricci curvature scalar, the G mu nu denotes the metric tensor, the lambda denotes the cosmological constant, the G is the good old Newton's gravitational constant, C is the speed of light, and T mu nu calls for the stress energy momentum tensor. Right, now you might be wondering with all those equations and hieroglyphics and all those, uh, you know, mu, nu and whatnot, what not, what does it ultimately lead to? It ultimately helps us to measure the curvature. Right on your screen, you see that I have given an analogy that the curvature of Jupiter is more because of its weight, right? We won't call it weight, we call it curvature, right? You compare that on the right hand side with Earth, you see that the curvature of Earth is less. And then you compare it with mercury, which has got a fairly less amount of curvature. So the basic idea of uh, Einstein's field equations and all those curvature tensors is what? It's just to give you that how much the, uh, uh, the, the, the curvature happens, how much the mass causes the change or the dent in curvature. Remember that famous analogy that a sheet has been spread out and you put a massive ball right on the top and then you put things around and the planets goes. You can think that is called a rubber sheet analogy. 
But we are, I'm trying to give you a further more in-depth idea. So the curvature of space-time, the planets or anything which causes the curvature is being measured by Einstein's field equations. I hope that is clear. Now, as soon as we measure the curvature of space-time, what I told, that there is a curve, right? Now, when I or a part particle is particularly moving along that curve, I'm moving from here and down to there, then that movement, will it be straight? The movement will not that be curved. That is what we are trying to find out in the next section of our video. It is a Greek term which is called geodesic, that is measurement, right? Geo means earth. So uh, well, the, the geodesic is basically what is called the shortest movement or the shortest path that a particular particle takes along the curvature of space-time. So space and time has already been united by Einstein and special relativity. We are further generalizing that space-time. You can see on the screen, I have just given you that those two points and then in curvature, these are the red lines, which means that these are the shortest possible uh, path between them. I remember the famous analogic given by Amul Kumar Chaudhary that if you take a tram path, right, it is over here, and you ask a mathematician that where will the tram lead to? So he will say that if there is a uh, initial conditions, you give f equals to ma and the second order derivative, the tram will move in this direction. If you ask a rickshaw puller on the road, it will say that the tram will move exactly in the direction which is laid out. And that is the idea of geodesic. So particle or a body will follow its shortest path. The second illustration I have given actually shows that we have generalized the straight line equation into curvature, right? And the source of this curvature is the stress energy momentum tensor. And this effect, that is the curvature which has been caused uh, the, due to the presence of mass, that specific curvature is where the uh, where the where the where the where the particle follows. So th this is a curved space space, and the and the and the particle follows the curved space. If it is a flat space, it follows this pass flat space. So the curvature which is being caused by the ma ma by the presence of mass, which is being measured by the stress energy momentum tensor, the particle simply follows that path. Nothing else, nothing else, and that is what is called geodesic. The shortest path that the particle still, uh, takes, which eventually we'll see that light takes, is, is, that is what is called gravity. A further illustration right on your screen, it is called geodesic deviation. So you see a ball when it is moving on a straight, par uh, straight line, it moves straight. Don't worry about what is a sectional curvature, we are not going to deal with that. When, uh, the, when, the, with, uh, when it is the shape of a sphere, as you can see that the ball shrinks in size, and when the uh, geodesics are something like this, the size of the ball increases uh, as it moves up. So first one, the size, uh, ball remains same. The second one, size of the ball shrinks, positive curvature, and size of the ball increases. That is what is called the negative curvature. So the curvature is being measured by stress, by these tensors, all those stress tensors, stress energy momentum tensors, and the particle following the path of the curvature are called geodesics. So now we have got geodesics, and the immediate question that comes in our mind is that the particles follow the geodesics, we all understand. Does light also follow the path of geodesic? Does gravity affect the path of a light? I've made a complete separate video on that. You can go to my uh, playlist. But now you see what is happening is that particles which are following the geodesic or the curvature path uh, is, is either uh, it is curved or it is straight. So let us see that whether light actually follows the same path or not. Here on your uh, screen, I have just given you a kind of a, a basic demonstration that the sun, which has got a huge kind of a, uh, which has kind of a huge mass, uh, if you take that rubber sheet analogy, is pressed somewhere there and it causes a dent. So when it causes a dent, obviously it causes what? A curvature. And this curvature is being affected by the light ray. You see closely in this illustration that this is the gravity is the bending of space-time. Space -time. Gravity is the bending of space-time due to matter. There's light which is generally followed by this. In the absence of mass, the photon travels in a straight line. But in the presence of a sun, it takes right down this path. And the curvature has been caused. So the photon, the, the photon takes a path 
uh, of the geodesic that appears to be curved. So here we prove that the curvature of space-time actually affects the light. So it is not the gravity or something which is pulling or the mass of the photon is being affected. No, the photon has got massless in certain terms. But yes, photon also has got a very negligible mass. But that is not the point. The point is that the curvature of space-time, which we are measuring with tensor, causing is causing a dent. And when the particle, obviously, when it flows like straight, it will follow straight. But if you get a kind of a dent like this, what will go? It will go this and then up and then and this. So it will follow a natural path. That is the idea of geodesic. It will follow a natural path. It will follow the usual curvature of the space-time. And that is the idea of geodesic. Question is that if the path is being affected, or the light is being affected, can it be experimentally verified? Can it be seen that, yes, there is a deflection of the starlight? That is what demands a huge courage, and that is the next part of our video. The Eddington experiment was an observational test of general relativity organized by the British astronomers Frank Watson Dyson and Arthur Stanley Eddington in 1919. The observations were of the total solar eclipse taking place on 29th of May 1919 and were carried out by two expeditions, one to the West African island of Princip and other to the Brazilian town of Sobral. The aim of the expedition was to measure the gravitational deflection of starlight. I've just shown you what it is this. So uh, the total ecl uh, solar eclipse which happened on 29th of May 1919, as you can see on the photograph, that the starlight was actually pointed towards something else. It was, it was in a different direction, but with the presence of the mass of the sun, it has been deflected, and we see that the angle of deflection, it is very, very small, 4 gm by c square d. If you do, do the calculation, it is very negligible, but uh, it is, uh, we are happy that it is at least not zero. So you see the smiling face of uh, uh, Albert Einstein's, Einstein's general theory of relativity has been finally been proved. It was Soldner who is mostly remembered uh, for having concluded the best known Newton's corpuscular theory that light would be diverted by heavenly bodies and in 1801 paper he published it. But here is uh, what Albert Einstein did and on your uh, screen I'm trying to show you the overall idea. So the Newton's angle you see was 0 0.88 arc seconds which was later corrected by Einstein's angle which is 1.75 arc seconds. So the bending of light around the massive object is now known as gravitational lensing and the biggest example of gravitational lensing in today's era is the JWST, James Webb Space Telescope. We can see the galaxies which are just behind uh, the gravitational lensing is making it viewable. Now this was where until we prove it as you understand physics is not um, correct so uh, the Einstein's the Eddington experiment actually proved general theory of relativity which predicts that the presence of mass causes a space-time curvature and the deflection of light. During the, um, I, I think yeah it was during that time uh, or rather the day when it was proved Arthur Eddington uh, went to a grand dinner at the Royal Astronomical Society, right? And as you can see uh, that he made a parody of uh, Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat. Uh, he made a parody of Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat style. And here I would like to show you that wonderful poem. You can see on the screen he writes that, uh, Oh, leave the wise or measure to collate. One thing at least is certain, light has weight. One thing is certain and the raised debate, light rays when near the sun do not go straight. So this is a parody uh, based on the idea of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam that uh, Arthur Eddington met and he attended uh, the Royal Astronomical Society's dinner and he was too happy and Einstein was happy, we are happy that general theory of relativity has finally been experimentally verified. So uh, the question is that what is the act examining of uh, the exact solution of general relativity? Most of the time you read through internet, etc. You will sign the exact solution of general relativity is what? Okay, before I show you the illustration, let me uh, give you a very quick understanding of that. Now see what happens when we try to plug in the values in Einstein's field equations and try to solve. 
that the presence of curvature, whatever it causes. Remember that Einstein's field equations or general relativity takes place in a massive scale. I'm mean going to say scales which are huge. It is not that I am present on this uh, floor and it is obviously causing a dent in space time. How much it is, it won't be measured. I'm going mean to say you can measure, but the effects will be almost negligible. So we measure it in high scales, like quantum mechanics is in minuscule level. We, make a, we measure it in very high scales, mass of Jupiter or maybe black holes or something like that. The problem arises when we are plugging in those values of Einstein's field equations, it gets enormously complicated. It becomes so complicated that humanly it is not possible. We take use of softwares, etc. So we try to normalize the field equations and get into something which is more or less kind of an okay, okay thing that we will try to measure them. So we assume certain things. For example, if I want to measure something, so if, if the sun was not out, if the wind was not moving at a velocity, if the temperature was so, then I can measure that how much uh, speed or whatever it is being. Right? So if the sun is not out, if the wind is not, these are all assumptions. And that is why we call it is an exact solution not a, a kind of a, a, a perfect solution. Exact solution means there are a lot of assumptions. Now you see the screen. The usage of Einstein's field equation, it describes how energy and momentum cause curvature and curvature itself is described by the metric. And Einstein field equations determine the metric depending on the energy content of that space time. So field equations are extremely complicated. I was telling nonlinear second order partial differential equation in, in most cases, it is difficult to have an, uh, it is difficult to solve. So this is basically the problem. Now you see right on the screen, we get solution from what is called a vacuum solution. These are all assumptions. Let me tell you, these are assumptions. So assuming that there is no matter in space time, then there is weak field solution where gravity is slight and the metric deviations are slight. And the symmetric solutions have a large portion of symmetry which is called Schwarzschild's metric or isotropy. That means what is happening out here is that we are actually taking certain assumptions uh, which are vacuum solution, weak field solutions and symmetric solutions. And then assuming this, this, this to be true, let us now plug in those values. Let us now find out that how we can solve the Einstein field equations provided we are this given those values. So vacuum solution, that means there is no matter. Obviously, if there is no matter, things become easier. When weak field solution, gravitation and metrics are a little bit slight. Obviously, things become much easier. Symmetric solutions, that means spherical, symmetric, non-rotating, etc. Talking of all the symmetric solutions, etc., takes us back to one time which was World War I. And it was this time that the World War I was full waging and there was a letter which suddenly came one a fine morning in the post of Albert Einstein. What did this letter tell? 22nd of December 1915, Albert Einstein received a letter. And the paper of the letter was bloodstained, parched, and you know, it was quite dirty, torn up, etc. It was from the bunker of First World War. A gentleman has written a letter and his name was Karl Schwarzschild. He has written, as you see, the war is kindly disposed toward me, allowing me, despite fierce gunfire at a decidedly terrestrial distance, to take this to walk into your lands of ideas. It was Karl Schwarzschild, the first uh, exact solution was designed by him. If you go to my inspirational story section, you will see that it was the, it was a sheer strike, uh, I would say, it was a sheer genius, uh, you know, who actually uh, measured uh, the exact solution of Einstein's field equations. In the bunker, when the war is going on, when the missiles are being fired, the bullets are being fired, Karl Schwarzschild actually find out the first exact solution of Einstein's field equation. That means he find out the solution of what we will see is that of a Schwarzschild radius which led up to the formation of black hole, right? But it is exact solution. That means he assumed that it's the, whatever the model that he is calculating is spherical, 
uh, right? It's nice spherical, it is symmetric, it is non-rotating, it is non-charged. All those assumptions are there and you find out the exact solution. Right on your screen is a detailed uh, idea of Schwarzschild radius. So is Carl Schwarzschild found if the radius is below the gravitational attraction, uh, the radius below which the gravitational attraction between the particles of a body must cause to a uh, gravitational collapse. So any object with physical radius smaller than Schwarzschild radius is going to be uh, ultimately a black hole. And you see this Rs is actually the Schwarzschild radius. And if I take the value of G and C squared to be one, because these are constant, Rs becomes equals to 2m. So in the first world war, he doesn't need a, a nice AC air conditioned room and uh, other things. He can work in uh, World War I conditions. He found out the exact solution, Schwarzschild radius, which actually tells that matter or, or the radius beyond which things will shrink and go into the black hole. Look into this photograph or illustration. I would say in, in singularity when R becomes zero, uh, space-time singularity where the gravity is so intense that the space time big breaks down. And when R becomes to Rs, it is called a coordinate, sim uh, a coordinate singularity. That means that any object, as you see on the uh, screen, that a uh, Earth, Jupiter, Moon, or a car, or a pin, or an elephant, even me, can be shrunk into a black hole. That was the basic idea. If we can squeeze that object down to the Schwarzschild radius. So the first exact solution came from Carl Schwarzschild radius with a letter in 1915. And Einstein was really stunned to find that because he was the person who founded the Einstein field equations, yet he was unable to find a kind of an exact solution. Uh, I think history tells that he read the paper in the Prussian, Prussian Academy of Mathematical Sciences, appreciated the work of Carl but his contribution of the Schwarzschild radius did not die. Final part of the video that comes is that, does time stop near a black hole? Now, we, uh, as we have learning, we are going ahead with the space-time curvature and all those uh, stuffs which measures the curvature of space-time. Uh, the curvature which is being caused by the presence of mass because space and space-time, both of them are being, uh, I would say, uh, blended together into a space-time. Definitely, if the space is being curved in this way, the time will also be curved in that way. I mean to say, in, in the sense. So, uh, right on the screen, what I'm trying to tell you is that, you see, the sun, which has got a lesser mass than a white dwarf, has got a lesser amount of curvature. The white dwarf length is even less, and the neutron star's uh, length is even less compared to that of a black hole, because the mass of the black hole causes the maximum space-time curvature. So it is simple that the length which we are measuring in terms of space-time length is being caused by the space-time curvature. So if the curvature of the mass of the object is huge, obviously the space and time will curve. And if the time curves, that means the time, uh, the length uh, which we are measuring of the time is much, much, much longer. So if it is so longer, then definitely it will take a more time to go around. So here on the screen, you can see that uh, it is a flat surface where there is no curvature from sun to neutron star and finally to black hole. The curvature is more. So the time is taken more than a flat space and time slows down near a black hole due to the extremely strong gravitational field of a black hole. And you can see that I have shown you that the space x, y, z in this is curved and the time is curved in this. So more massive is the uh, object, more is the dent of the space time, more is the curvature. And more is the curvature means you take more time. Obviously, just imagine in this way that you're going straight from year to year. How much time it takes? Maybe three seconds. Then I ask you to go around that then you go around that. So more you are moving away, the more is the curvature. That means you're moving in a curved space time. That means you're taking more time. A further easier demonstration is this one. Time slows down. Time is just a coordinate system in general relativity. Remember, this is extremely important. Time is just a coordinate in general relativity. It is nothing more than that. And you can see I have shown in the demonstration that when a person while walking around a black hole, uh, the Schwarzschild black hole, he starts at 9 a.m. and due to the high curvature, that means you have to go all around that building and that building and you end up at 3 p.m. While on the Earth, it takes around 9 a.m. and you met or you complete that distance within 11 a.m. 
So time really doesn't stop near black hole, but because it is due to the curvature of space time, the time dilation or uh, the time, time the, 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 the measurement coordinate has become huge, it becomes longer, and that is the reason that the space-time curvature, uh, the, the, the time, the, the time is, is more. So more massive the mass, more time you require to travel. So now I hope you understand those fictions that uh, the age shortens and you take more time when you come back. Obviously these are true, but this is much more of a mathematical idea, much more of a clear understanding. So that's it. That completes our journey of general theory of relativity. Uh, I hope you liked it. Please do let me know in the comment section. What I have tried to do is that I've given you right from the inception of special relativity and slowly moved into general theory of relativity. I have tried to complete all the components which is most important. Today I won't be uh, wrapping up, uh, you know, phase by phase, chapter by chapter, which I generally do in all the videos, because the intention of this video was not to give you too deep into mathematics, not into, uh, you know, understanding the, uh, the, uh, the, the mathematics or the uh, signs and notions and differential geometry and Limacan curve, and all those, but to give you a basic idea that what and what are the components and how general theory of really relativity evolved and who are the people who are responsible, how Einstein collaborated and gave a wonderful theory of relativity. Most importantly, when you learn theory of general theory of relativity, you skip certain areas, you really don't move across or find those areas like why do we need tensors, why do we need non-Euclidean geometry, why do we need differential geometry, what would do, what would help. So that is most important. I hope you like my video. Uh, I try to give a more or less a clearer idea, not mathematical, neither intuitive, but as I always tell, uh, intermediate path, which is better than any other general understanding of general relativity. Uh, do let me know in the comment section because I'm coming up with more important videos on helping students on the examination pattern. Do let me know your comments. Please click on the subscribe button and click on the notification bell icon so that you receive all the notification from student, physics from students. The sun is out. It is terrible. The sun has always uh, been responsible for the causing of uh, space-time curvature mass. Here it is generating immense heat and I am sure that I need to go down, otherwise I will burn. Thank you very much for watching me on Physics for Students. Stay safe, stay happy, and have a nice weekend. And don't forget to put up your comments, how you liked and what are your views on this video. This is Seanak signing off and wishing you a great day ahead. Best wishes and promising you to come back with few more interesting videos on physics and mathematics. Till then, goodbye. <music>